Hello and welcome everyone. We're really glad that you could join us here today for this webinar on an extremely important topic, which is breach containment. We're going to be exploring the data breach crisis that's been taking place around the world, and we're going to explore the new generation of security that is addressing those issues and helping make enterprises safer as the hacking crisis continues. We're delighted to have a great lineup of speakers today for this topic. First off, let me introduce Jason Bloomberg. Jason is president of Intellix and a contributor to Forbes. He is the leading industry analyst and expert on achieving agile digital transformation by architecting business agility into the enterprise. He writes for Forbes, for Wired, and his biweekly newsletter, The Cortex. And as president of Intellix, he advises business executives on their digital transformation initiatives. He trains architecture teams on agile transformation and agile architecture, and he helps technology vendors and service providers communicate their agility stories. You should definitely check out his latest book. It's called The Agile Architecture Revolution, published by Wiley in 2013. And we're especially excited to be working with Jason and hearing from Jason on this topic because he has a unique perspective with his expertise on enterprise agility and operational agility and how that intersects with cybersecurity and ensuring that we're able to get our work done but do so safely. So welcome, Jason. I also want to introduce Satyam Tiagi, who is the CTO of Certus Networks. Satyam is an industry thought leader and innovator in IT security and networking. He's responsible for some of the most significant advances in endpoint smartphone and application security over the past decade. He's been awarded four patents in advanced application security and network management, including inventions that are now utilized by the likes of Cisco and Avaya in their security and network management portfolios. And in fact, Satyam drove the creation of the Samsung Knox security suite when he was at Samsung and was responsible for creating the, the world's first smartphone to qualify under the very rigorous U.S. Department of Defense security standards. So we're delighted that, that Satyam is on the team here and going to be presenting some of his insights. Again, I'm Adam Boone. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Certus Networks. And I'm going to set the stage for us and share a little bit of the context of what we see happening, what our customers have seen happening uh, with the IT security crisis. Uh, first off, just in case you're not familiar with Certus Networks, we are an IT security solutions provider. We make software-defined security products that directly address the application security needs of the modern enterprise. And Satyam is going to share a few of those insights with you a little bit later. But first off, what's going on that is leading to this widespread breach crisis that's taking place and really hitting enterprises of all different types around the world? Well, there are three main trends, main, three main factors leading to this. Number one, our enterprises are fully borderless these days. Applications that previously might have been contained to a trusted network environment are now shared everywhere with external employees, with third parties like contractors in the supply chain, and they're also shared on devices that are out of IT's control. So applications, enterprises, and in general, our IT operations have become borderless. What happens when that takes place is that firewalls fail to keep pace with how applications are shared and used and how users ultimately interact with them. What we've seen is that this creates what has been the number one breach vector in modern times, and that is that a compromised user ends up being targeted and gives up their credentials to a hacker, and that in turn puts all the enterprise's applications at risk. Well, the traditional way of stopping these sort of attacks, the traditional way of preventing that sort of hacking from taking place is through segmentation. But we've seen extreme fragmentation of the segmentation tools and uh, techniques in today's environment. We've seen silos of network-centric network security and, frankly, very rigid infrastructure-tied segmentation that is not application or user aware and hence cannot stop this data breach attack vector that we're seeing so much of. The bottom line here is that today's enterprise IT is only as secure as any individual compromised user, and that includes your partners, 
your supply chain, your employees sitting in Starbucks, and anybody who's using a personal device or a personal application. Just digging into that a little bit further, you need to think of it this way. Your applications are only as secure as the least secure or the most vulnerable of these different parties. And this is why our attack surface is being described as exploding in size. In other words, the risk posed by all the different users for granted access to all these range of applications in your environment, that's your attack surface. That's what the hackers are going after. And that's going to explode even further as IoT, bring your own device, bring your own application, and shadow IT types of initiatives take place. So one last little bit of background and context before I hand off to Jason to go into much greater detail on this attack surface issue. I want to share with you a little bit of the context of the history of the security architecture so we can see how this badly needed evolutionary step is taking place. Back in the 90s, a couple of decades ago, the firewall was introduced and the standard security arch architecture became perimeter-based, the idea that we're able to keep the bad guys out, set up these firewalls, and essentially can contain within our trusted network environments and IT environments, the applications and the users. Well, fast forward to about 2010, and we've seen that hackers have understood this architecture and have figured out a whole different uh, variety of ways to violate it. And so now we've seen this huge investment, this huge trend really over the past five or so years to improve threat detection and response. You know, it used to be the case that uh, a, a breach occurred, a hacker got inside, and that breach may not have been detected for a year or more, uh, allowing them to have just all types of leisurely time to exfiltrate the data. Well, yeah, in the past uh, three or four years, we've seen several billion dollars of investment go into improving threat detection and response. But even now, that has only been improved to, on average, 200 days. In other words, on average, after a breach occurs, we're still looking at 200 days before the typical enterprise is able to detect that that breach happened. And they're often, and they're often learning because of external sources who notify them that, say, they're seeing patterns indicating compromise. That's an eternity. That's like saying, uh, yeah, the operation was a smashing success. The patient died, but the operation was a huge success. It's just not conceivable that we're going to be able to protect our enterprises if we're waiting 200 days before a breach can be detected and responded to. So that brings us to the new generation of security. What's being introduced now and the use cases that we're starting to, to see our customers adopt, and that's breach containment that's focusing on shrinking the attack surface, isolating applications using things like strong encryption, and being sure that you're able to, in real time, gate who is getting access to your applications and ensure that, <clears throat> and ensure that the uh, applications are safe from end to end. We're going to go into a lot more detail on the technology behind that, but now I'd like to hand over to Jason Bloomberg, to pick this up and share his insights around these topics. Jason? Well, thank you very much, Adam, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, talking about uh, breach containment. So uh, there's my email address and Twitter handle, and a little about me. Uh, Adam did a great job of introducing me, so there's really very little to add. Uh, but uh, uh, I will give you a bit of information about how to sign up for our newsletter for at, the end of, at the end of my talk. So let's, let's just dive right in. So. If you think about the cybersecurity situation uh, today and you step back a bit, uh, we have a real challenge on our hands. And the challenge is that it's just getting more and more difficult to keep the hackers out, keep attackers out. But for the attackers, it's getting easier, right? It's just becoming increasingly straightforward in terms of the approaches that the attackers use. Uh, being able to obtain appropriate malware is very simple. It's very straightforward. Uh, and this equation is going the wrong direction, right? It's getting harder and harder to keep the bad guys out. And for the bad guys, it's getting easier and easier to penetrate the uh, large organizations, right? On the enterprise side, you have to make sure you keep everybody out, right? Uh, but if you're an attacker, uh, uh, one successful attack uh, is, is all you need. So 
if you fast forward 100 years, what's this world going to look like? Are we going to continue this trend and have some sort of dystopian nightmare run by hackers? Or will we be able to turn this around and have a much more positive future, sort of a, a Star Trek uh, future where uh, computers are very intelligent, but, uh, but they don't misbehave? Well, uh, hopefully we can shift more towards Star Trek and less toward uh, William Gibson. Uh, we need to absolutely change this equation. So why is it so easy for attackers today? Well, there are a variety of different ways that attackers seek to penetrate uh, enterprises and other organizations, but the most basic, the most common, most straightforward is phishing. So phishing with a PH. So phishing is essentially uh, sending people emails that fool them into either clicking a link uh, that they shouldn't click or downloading a piece of software they shouldn't download. It's very easy, right? Uh, essentially, coming up with very large lists of, of corporate email addresses. You can just buy those online. Uh, you can send millions of people an email, uh, and all you need, again, is just one person to click that malicious link or download that malicious attachment, uh, and and you're in, right? So it's very straightforward and easy for the attackers to to do this. Uh, there's uh, more sophisticated approach to phishing that a very, um, uh, in a very, has a very catching name. It's a spear phishing. Uh, and spear phishing requires a bit more sophistication on the part of the attacker, but really not all that much. With spear phishing, instead of just essentially sending out tons and tons and tons of anonymous phishing emails in hopes that uh, one or two people here and there would click on them, uh, the, the attacker spends a little extra time crafting a personalized attack email. So they go on social media and they figure out, you know, some information about their target, maybe their boss's name, uh, other information, so, you know, maybe an email address of the boss, and uh, maybe they uh, get a hold of some email from your boss that has the email signature in it, and they intentionally craft an email that looks genuine. It, it comes from somebody you know. Uh, it has instructions um, that are within the realm of plausibility, uh, although often they are, you know, you know, send you know, wire money somewhere, so it may be a bit suspicious. But again, uh, and the rest of the email may look perfectly valid, uh, and only one person needs to click on that uh, in order to uh, allow the hackers to be in. It, you know, it may be sending, uh, wiring money, or again, it may simply be uh, downloading uh, a file or clicking on a link. So uh, if you think about it, as Adam said, traditional perimeter security, sitting on firewalls, does nothing to stop phishing attacks, right? Firewalls don't stop emails from coming in. Uh, and even your, you know, anti-spam protection, it may catch some of these phishing emails, but the spear phishing ones look very genuine. And they look, they look genuine, the good ones, not only to the people who are receiving them, but to those uh, anti-spam filters as well. So uh, they may not all get through, but, but some of them typically will. So... What this means is that uh, part of the problem uh, that everything that is making everything get worse is that we have an exploding attack surface. Enterprises have uh, uh, increasing attack surface, which is essentially all the various ways that attackers can penetrate the organization. So we have a number of different ways that attackers may infiltrate an organization, uh, phishing attacks or other approaches, but they are also targeting other people. As Adam mentioned, it's not just employees. It could be contractors. It could be third parties. It could be, you know, suppliers. Uh, it may even be customers who have access to your uh, internal network to some extent, uh, and uh, that is sufficient to for, a, for an attacker to get some advantage. So if you multiply these two numbers, right, the ways an attacker might infiltrate and the number of users they can target, that's the attack surface. And both of these factors may be increasing, right? We have an increased number of digital touch points as we have a variety of additional form factors uh, with uh, mobile, mobile phones and tablets as well as more sophisticated point of sale systems and the Internet of Things, which is adding uh, a whole new range of uh, digital touch points from everything from uh, factory equipment to, uh, uh, you know, it, it, Coke machines uh, on the side of the street to to uh, uh, traffic uh, traffic uh, signals. All of these may be points that the the hacker may want to uh, compromise. Uh, so uh, and furthermore, the number of people 
is continuing to go up that they may uh, focus on. Uh, and the fact that so many different enterprise apps are now accessible via very variety of touch points also provides additional ways for attackers to penetrate an organization. So if you may, you may think about your, your smartphone, it may have access to your SharePoint application. It may have access to your timesheet application. It may have access to uh, some sort of, uh, you know, corporate project management application. Uh, any number of applications are now accessible via that smartphone, and all of those now add to the uh, corporate attack, attack surface. So uh, let's put on our hacker's hat or mask, as the case may be, uh, and go through the steps uh, an attacker may use in order to uh, achieve their goals of a particular cyber attack. And these steps we're going to call the kill chain. And the kill chain actually came out of Lockheed Martin, a U.S. government contractor, which explains the somewhat militaristic tone uh, of the of the name, but but that is still what we call it, and it, it sort of gives it this uh, extra import. So there are seven steps. So there's four on this slide, three on the next one. So the first step, the attacker is going to gather information. So this may simply be buying a, a, a list of 100,000 email addresses, or for uh, spear phishing, they may poke around on social media a bit to learn a bit more, or may find some uh, corporate emails that they can take, and they can take the signatures off and, and turn into spear phishing emails. Uh, step two is weaponization, right? The, uh, uh, the spear phishing email has to have a link to some malicious website or some so, sort of malicious uh, attachment. Well, where did they get this malware? Well, this uh, vision of some sort of uh, high-tech, sophisticated hacker uh, handcrafting malware in some dark corner of, the, of their, I don't know, parents' basement, that may be the case, but more often than not, the malware is just available online, and you may be able to download it for free or go to some malware site uh, and purchase it for a small amount of money. Uh, so malware is very easy to get, and it doesn't require a lot of sophistication. So, so the attacker... Uh, has the phishing email, has the malware, you know, turns it into attachment or puts it on a website, and then delivers it via, uh, uh, usually via phishing, so that's just send out a bulk email, and there's many ways to do that. Uh, once the uh, person then clicks on that link or downloads that email, and again, you may send hundreds of thousands of emails, and only, you only need one person to actually uh, click that link, that now puts the malware on that employee's computer or potentially some other system. It could be a point of sale system or a credit card processing uh, unit or, uh, you know, an Internet of Things uh, endpoint, uh, whatever it may be. Well, that may not be the target, right? It doesn't really matter if you're on uh, the, some employee's computer. You want, to move, uh, you want your malware, if you're the attacker, to move laterally around the network. And malware does this automatically. That is, it is going to you know, show up in one location on the network and automatically probe uh, other systems within the network to see what it can find. And it will go through all the different ports and all the different openings. Uh, and if it finds an opening, it will copy itself to that new system and continue the process, essentially infecting the entire uh, network. So if there's nothing to stop it, it will find the vulnerabilities and move laterally across the organization uh, from less uh, sensitive systems to, from the perspective of the attacker, more desirable, more sensitive systems. Okay, so that's step four. Moving on to step five. Once it gets to that system, it will install itself. Uh, and keep in mind, the vulnerable system could be on-premise, could be in your data center, could be in the cloud as well. And today, so many enterprise applications, mission-critical applications are running in the cloud. Sometimes the malware doesn't even have to arrive on-premise to do all its damage. There is sufficient, uh, sufficient mission-critical information, uh, customer data, whatever the hacker is uh, going for, simply in the cloud. That may be the entire um, the target. So uh, simply protecting your on-premise systems may not, uh, even if you could, even if you could protect them, may not be sufficient. So once the malware is on a vulnerable system and is running, uh, what it typically does is phones home. That is, the malware is internal to your network and is able to essentially send a request out to the attacker. So if you think about it, if you set up a firewall, the firewall is protecting the internal network from traffic coming from outside. 
not the other way around as a rule. Right? Typically, you expect to be able to take information from inside your network and send it out through the firewall. Right? If you're sending an email or sending a file, the firewall is going to say, well, that's fine. It's coming from a protected area going out to the Internet. I will let that through. So malware acting on a vulnerable system can send out a request that, uh, that will now establish a connection with the attacker. So once this connection is established, essentially the attacker now has complete control. They can take over that system or any of the systems that are compromised, uh, and, and, now, and now essentially uh, they have the keys to the kingdom. So there's three basic patterns, uh, once, uh, three basic patterns of the actions on objective once the attacker has this complete control. Uh, they may simply grab what they're looking for and run because they realize that the, uh, their target may figure out that they are there and, and shut them down, so they may uh, move very quickly and steal you know, customer data and then, and then you know, uh, cover their tracks to avoid detection. But as uh, Adam mentioned, it takes hundreds of days for a lot of these attacks to be discovered. So many attackers realize, hey, I'm in, I have control, I have time. So they may move slowly and, and takes, you know, be very careful with their steps in order to avoid detection. There's a lot of software out there that is looking for these kinds of attacks, and the attackers know that software is looking for them. So if they have a lot of time on their hands, they will do what they can to stay below the noise level and move around quietly. Now, usually attackers are looking for some sort of valuable information, you know, credit card data, uh, confidential data of some sort. But that's not always the case, right? Sometimes hackers are just looking to cause damage. And there are some uh, spectacular examples of this, right? So if an attacker is just looking to cause damage and is not interested in stealing anything, then it's a whole different set of uh, activities that they're going to be involved in. They may simply be deleting files. They may simply be uh, you know, changing passwords. They may be uh, uh, creating other sorts of damage that may be a very different kind of behavior than uh, stealing information. So, uh, how are we going to stop this? Well, obviously, we need to take uh, preventative steps. You know, you need to have firewalls. Nobody is saying that you should get rid of your firewalls, and there are uh, plenty of other pieces of software that can help to prevent such attacks. Uh, but these attacks are getting better and better as well, right? This is that uh, uh, equation we need to change, right? It's harder and harder to prevent the attacks, and it's easier and easier to circumvent those measures. So modern attacks are persistent and resilient. Right? The malware is getting better at hiding its tracks, getting better at changing what it does so as to avoid detection, uh, and working its way around the existing prevention-centered prevention, prevention -centered products on the market. So prevention is necessary, but, but it, the uh, attack software, the malware, is continuing to be uh, to respond to those uh, improvements. Uh, another key problem is uh, simply patching software. So everybody knows that unpatched software is vulnerable. The reason why vendors patch their software is to patch vulnerabilities that have been recently detected. So every, every IT shop should have a rigorous uh, patching regimen that patches everything whenever a vendor comes out with a patch. Well, we all know that, but in practice, uh, that rigorous regimen may not be completely rigorous for a number of reasons. One is it's expensive. Two, there may be a lot of stuff to patch, and you just don't get to it all right away. And three, you always wonder whether a patch is going to cause some sort of unexpected problem. So especially in the enterprise context, if you're an IT ops manager, you're not necessarily going to install every vendor patch as soon as you get it. You may need to test it to make sure it doesn't cause other problems. Any of, those, uh, any of those issues, whether it's a delay uh, that's unintentional or an intentional delay, gives the attacker a window, right, whether it's unpatched software that they are looking for because they have malware that knows how to look for those vulnerabilities that the vendor has released, released a patch for. Uh, but if you haven't applied it yet, that now is the malware's opportunity. But even if you were theoretically able to patch everything immediately, Right, with no delay whatsoever, so every single, uh, every single vulnerability that a vendor found for anything that you have installed is immediately patched, that still isn't good enough because of the problem of zero-day attacks. So a zero-day attack is an attack that is essentially brand new. 
right? An attack that no, that the vendor that is the subject, you know, the, whose product is the subject of the attack, has not seen before. And in which case, they haven't come up with a patch for it yet. So it doesn't matter if you've applied all your patches. Zero-day attacks don't yet have patches. And those are always uh, a possibility, right? And they come up with annoying regularity. Now, obviously, if you are an attacker and you want to mount a zero-day attack and you're looking to buy one on the open Internet, it's going to be more expensive because they could really be only used once. But there's still plenty of them out there, and if you're an attacker and you want to mount a zero-day attack, there's really nothing that prevents you from doing so. So you can, you can try to prevent all of these different uh, uh, avenues of attack, and you can always spend more on prevention. And no matter how much you spend, it's never enough, right? It's never enough to guarantee that you have prevented all attacks. So uh, there's just two ways of looking at this. You could say that you know, perfect security is infinitely expensive, or you can say that perfect security is impossible. They really amount to the same thing. So what can you do? Well, you can compartmentalize. You can limit the impact of breaches. So instead of saying we're going to prevent all breaches, we'll do our best, but we realize that, that in some cases the attackers will be able to get malware on our systems. What we want to do is reduce the damage they can do. So we can do this through compartmentalization. So as Adam mentioned, compartmentalization, you know, being able to segment our network, we've been doing this for, for, for a while. But the challenge is that in many cases we don't get it right. Right. And here's that. This is the uh, this is the lesson of the Titanic. Right. The Titanic was supposedly unsinkable because it had compartmentalization. It had compartments that uh, all of you know that that uh, if one was breached, the others would keep the ship afloat. But of course, the Titanic ended up sinking anyway because the water was able to go over the tops of the compartments, which is something they didn't plan on. So uh, compartmentalization is important, but you have to get it right. So what, what is the benefit? Well, you want to limit damage from attacks, right? If an attacker can only get to a less vulnerable system but cannot move laterally to a more vulnerable, a more sensitive system, then that limits the damage, but it also reduces the appeal, right? If an attacker... Uh, you know, attackers have a choice in the companies they attack, and if they realize that one company, they might be able to breach, but they're not going to find anything valuable because they have a rigorous segmentation or compartmentalization approach versus some other company who does not have that kind of approach, the attacker will likely pick the easier target. So uh, simply reducing the appeal of a target is a huge part of uh, breach containment. So you want it to be cost effective, and this is an important point as well, because prevention you, is never perfect. You can always spend more on it. But breach containment, you can show it's working. So you can make an investment in breach containment that has a provable result. With prevention, you're just never sure. You can spend all this money, and you're not sure you, you can prevent the next attack. With breach containment, you can you can invest a certain amount of money and have uh, assurance that breaches are being contained because you can find them and I say that, and show that they've been contained. So uh, critically important to use the right tools in order to get this compartmentalization right. So uh, that's it for my talk. So uh, there's my email address again, a picture of my latest book. Stay tuned for my next one. I haven't announced it yet, but it's coming next year. My Twitter handle is the Ebus Wizard, and if you can't wait to download this slide, can't wait for the folks at Certus to send you the deck, you can send an email address to breachandintellix.com. If you've been fiddling with your phone during this webinar, and I know you all have, you can't fool me. Every single one of you has been fiddling with your phone in the last 15 minutes, so take that phone, send an email to breachandintellix.com. You will get a single one and only one uh, auto response email with a link to the deck on SlideShare and how to sign up for our newsletter and a bit of more information, but it will just be the one email. So with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to uh, Satyam Tiagi. So Satyam, take it away. Thank you so much, Jason. That was excellent. Uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation about the breach containment and the very good descriptions of, of the attacks and how it's so easier to do them. So with that, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, there is a Q&A panel and you can enter your questions in the Q&A panel. And I know I have a lot of questions of, of Jason's 
excellent descriptions and you may want to add your questions as well so with that i'll jump into my section of the uh, presentation uh, i'll talk about the breach containment technologies and solutions but before that i'll just summarize some of the things that jason already pointed out that it is way way much easier to do these attacks and when we think of a breach i have visualized the top picture here first that this is what a breach looks like but more and more as uh, the breaches look more like the bottom picture and uh, the verizon dbir is a great source of uh, information on data breaches and it does uh, consolidate a lot of data and the, what it it says is that 95% of breaches uh, involving harvesting or stealing credentials or user logins and stuff which is essentially the bottom picture 95% of the time that's what's happening and i know we have lot of this discussion about is it the source of the attack external is it internal who was involved uh, regardless of what the source of attack is the cause of damage usually is the stolen credential and somebody coming in uh, and Uh, one of uh, the presenters i worked with john sawyer uh, who is a, a very renowned hacker he, he has won uh, the defcon championship multiple times he says at some point during an attack the attacker always becomes an insider and is inside so uh, bottom line is we have to get over this mindset of that we will prevent all breaches we have to understand at some point somebody will be inside and we cannot continue to trust that the our inside network or our inside parameter is secure so in the terms of containing the breaches i think again jason mentioned about titanic and we have since evolved and and i think it's a great idea it applies to uh, our the the real world physical world stuff applies to our digital world as well if we could segment uh, uh properly and if we could contain the breach and and prevent from jumping from one segment to other segment that would be uh, just perfect if, if if that was just possible and to be honest as a security industry over time we have been trying to do it for a while but we haven't been as successful and the reason is that it is extremely complicated to accomplish what we want to do what we really want to do in terms of segmentation is give users of a particular role or a particular uh, business need access to the business applications that they need to access but our segmentation controls are completely based on what type of infrastructure we have they change based on the cloud versus the lan versus the van we are doing ACLs, VLANs, VRFs, labels, uh, VPCs, and there are 20 different tools. Different teams are managing it, and there are themes in it. And the biggest challenge is any one of the intermediate uh, nodes in the network, if they are compromised, the whole segmentation scheme is is uh, vulnerable, and and that's what hackers exploit when. as jason mentioned they do lateral movement that's exactly what they are trying to do they they come in and they they exploit whatever segmentation we were trying to do using our networking and infrastructure tools bypass that and get to the segment that they really wanted to get to uh i guess the biggest thing to note here is that in spite of all the tools and and technologies we have developed we haven't been very successful add to this cloud iot mobile and some of the newer technologies this becomes more complex and the hacker stack becomes easier so let's look at it and from a back to the drawing board perspective what can we do and how can we accomplish uh, a proper segmentation uh, and a breach containment technique that can actually work and can pre- prevent these attacks from spreading and sp- and block that kill chain that jason mentioned at the lateral movement point sure we will not prevent all the phishing attacks some users will click those links 
respond to those emails, download those attachments, they will lose their credentials. But can we make that part of that breach that happened contained and limit the uh, attractiveness to the attacker on how far they can get and on what they can actually steal or compromise? So looking at the physical world, uh, again, an analogy I, I use from uh, a very smart analyst, John Kinderwack, that there is this model of, of zero trust. There we may have security at our borders, but whatever is our valuable asset, that is always protected, no matter where it goes. We don't declare this location, this land, uh, or this private network is secure. That asset is always secured. And if we believe in that security, we don't have to trust our infrastructure. And in fact, I, I take another quote from from uh, Roger Shell, and, and the way he articulated, and, and this happens in high assurance environments, that if uh, we do this properly, and if we can do this properly, we would not care if KGB was building uh, the infrastructure for our uh, DoD systems to run on. And that's kind of where we want to go to. And we'll talk about how cryptography and cryptographic segmentation uh, enables us to do something like that. So going again back to the physical world, one of the examples I, I use where we uh, have seen this to be successful is where there was hundreds of thousands of people involved in a mission, millions of people involved in its planning. Still, it was never leaked where the Normandy landing was going to happen. Germans had to divide their troops into multiple locations because they were never sure where exactly this uh, would happen. This was a perfect example of a need-to-know restriction. And if we can accomplish that same need-to-know principle and give the right users access to the right applications that they need to do their business, we would become a long way from where we are now in terms of the effectiveness of breach containment and the value that hackers get out of uh, doing these breaches. So based on those physical world, there was a lot of work done in digital world as well. and. Uh, a lot of this science came about when we first time had multi-user system, multics and some of the uh, technologies came around that. And there was very simple uh, concept there about control sharing, giving each user access to a resource based on their identity and based on their authorization and not giving them free access to everything and having a strong way uh, which was called reference monitor to enforce that such that every access is monitored and controlled and is granted only based on those uh, on the authorization level for every every user. This was the basis of the orange book, which is sort of the Bible of uh, security that was written in probably 1980s, except we never used it at an enterprise level, be always limited to the, the operating system level, whether it's security enhanced Linux, it is security enhanced Android, all the operating systems have, when they are used in high assurance environments, have this concepts built in, but we did not expand it out to the uh, enterprise level. And that's what we will try to show how we can accomplish that. And how this in the operating system world accomplishes this by even if you root these operating systems, you get root level privileges, you still don't get full access to the system. You are contained uh, to the segment that you have you gain access through. Without getting in too much detail here, I'll get in more detail on the enterprise side of these things. So when we think of the segmentation piece, we have today been able to do it on an infrastructure level, you saw the last picture, which was about internet, DMVs, LANs, VANs, cloud, and all the infrastructure components 
that make things uh, happen. We want to rethink this. That do we really? Is that how we want to draw the lines? And the truth is, our valuable assets are in business are uh, our applications, the CRMs, the, the source code, the billing and invoicing. These are applications. If we could, we would want to draw lines along those and separate those assets. If, think of it: if you were drawing a castle, you would want to protect the king, the queen, the treasury, and so on, and not thinking in terms of uh, where I can build walls based on the infrastructure. The second component of of segmentation is once you have created those segments is how do you decide who gains access to those segments? And again, today we have a, an implicit trust. This is a corporate device. This is a local area network. This, is com this traffic is coming from my branch office or from my headquarters, and we implicitly trust that. We believe the right way to grant access is based on a strong identity. Ident identify the user, figure out his role, and based on that, figure out what authorization he has. Maybe sales gets access to CRM, but does not get access to source code. Maybe engineering gets access to source code, but not to the CRM. And the contractors are only limited to the invoicing and billing and should not be able to get to more sensitive systems at all. Lastly, once we have created the segments and, and we are able to create these uh, authorization policy on into who is granted access. Last component of that is to look at who actually controls this. Who is the, in charge of the security? Is it the security officer or is he dependent on the network engineers, the field engineers, uh, contractors, and service providers? If we can give this control just to the security officers, that would be the ideal. So accomplishing this would significantly reduce what a breach uh, damage can happen. If I, once we have this in place, if I do compromise the contractor's credentials, the only application at risk will be billing and invoicing, regardless of how that application is accessed over the LAN, across the internet, regardless of what sort of device or network is used to access it, and regardless of whose infrastructure it is going over, through my service providers, through a contractor's infrastructure, on my local area network. Right. So that is what breach containment is about, and we'll get into how it can be actually accomplished uh, with cryptography. So this is how we see uh, uh, a breach containment architecture should look like with role-based access and cryptographic segments. The first thing you do is you take applications and define a cryptographic boundary around it. So in this example, what I have done is on the centralized management system, we call that the CryptoFlow creator. Uh, I have defined that this application, the red application, is, is secured with the confidential security profile. What that means in the real packet processing world is that these application servers, whether they are in the cloud, in the data center, spread across, any traffic that leaves or goes out of them is encrypted with the red key. These keys may be rotated uh, every hour, again, based on the protection profile, but this red application is, at this point, completely cryptographically isolated. Nobody has access to it. Uh, anything, Any packet you send to it is thrown away because it is not encrypted with the right key. Any packet that comes out of it uh, is encrypted and is garbage you cannot see uh, see it. So after I've cryptographically isolated it, now I start granting access based on user roles. So I take this user role, sales, which is pulled from the enterprise directory, such as an active directory or another LDAP system. And I say sales should be granted access to this red application because possibly this red application is a, a CRM. And I say operations should be granted access to this blue application. What that means is whenever these people in sales use their device to access, we verify their identity based on uh, certificates and ensure that he's the right user, belongs to the right role, which is sales, 
and the authorization policy says grant him access to the red cryptographic segment and he's granted access if you notice here i did not show any of the networking details here because it does not matter whether the user is coming across the internet is inside the same lan is coming across lan is in the branch office the security policy is exactly same the segmentation is done by a cryptography which is independent of infrastructure by its very nature so from the attack perspective what it means is even if this uh, user is compromised we are limiting him uh, in that segment and the attacker cannot go, jump from the red to the blue or blue to the red that's the core principle behind it this is how it looks in action when you have this uh, implementation in place if one of the user does get compromised uh, what happens is that compromise lives in that segment and cannot spread because there's 256 bit of encryption uh, or cryptography between the segments and there's no way you can jump from the other this is not like a vlan a 16 bit tag that you can spoof uh, you have to break a 256 bit a key to get across from one segment to other so just summarizing this in in how it it looks and feels instead of doing all this infrastructure work the vpns the firewall pin holes the vlans and all these different things what we are suggesting here is you define your business rules you say what your business rules say which users access uh, which applications and that is implemented end to end does not matter you are, you have data centers clouds mobiles branches it's consistent policy for the users and the applications lastly there is real data uh, which has been done for a lot of incidents and what they found out was if the access of users was limited to what they really needed if that was possible to do 86% of the data stolen uh, could be reduced so your damage could be reduced by 86% but more importantly your attack surface is also reduced so the the value of your asset cannot be changed but the likelihood of the breach is is significantly changed because now instead of attacking any user who has access to any system uh, in the enterprise i am limited to only those users who have access to the specific system that i want to target i have to find those five users who have access to point of sale system if i want to breach the credit card data so the likelihood of a breach is is reduced amount of damage i do is is significantly reduced that's the real impact here to summarize if we implement breach containment with proper cryptographic segment and role based access control we accomplish a shrinkage of the attack surface we accomplish users having access to what they need and are not being completely open to the rest of the world and lastly it is auditable security you you see it in business terms and you don't see it in terms of uh, the details of uh, your networking infrastructure so with that i'll hand it back to adam and we are open for questions please send your questions uh and we'll be happy to answer them great thank you satyam very interesting content there and uh, uh thanks also to jason for some uh, uh great comments as we saw initially jason spelled out for us a number of the ways that the attack surface is dramatically expanding in enterprises today thanks to how we do work how we access and share our applications and bring new devices into the mix Uh, and then Satyam uh, did a, a terrific job of outlining some of the parameters of what breach containment is, and he shared with you a glimpse of our CryptoFlow solutions, which are software-defined security products that allow you to actually set up end-to-end breach containment and uh, access control based on user roles for your applications. Uh, and by the way, uh, please do visit certusnetworks.com if you're interested in seeing more about those CryptoFlow solutions. You'll also see at the bottom of the slides that there is a uh, link to a new white paper about breach containment that uh, uh, Jason at Intellix has drafted and uh, and published.
So uh, again, we have some questions coming in, and feel free to use the question interface to uh, submit some questions to to uh, uh, the panelists here. First question coming in uh, looks like it's for Satyam. So Satyam, uh, the question is, how is user credential or identity asserted across distributed layers within a contained segment? Uh, thank you, Adam. Very good question here. Uh, so, yes, identity is the key, uh, and if it is not done properly, uh, that is where uh, you would be vulnerable, the most vulnerable. So, I, so in our system, the way it is done is we work with your identity access management system, your enterprise directory systems for one-time enrollment. So, every user, before they are get granted access to corporate application, enrolls once with whatever corporate credentials they have. Sometimes it's as simple as email and password. Sometimes it is uh, more different based on whatever enterprise directory credentials you have. But after this enrollment, this device that they use to enroll and their credentials are tied and a certificate, X.509 certificate is issued to them. That X.509 certificate is what to find their identity. And how that X.509 certificate is secured depends on the device's operating system. So in iOS, it will be different than how it's done in Android. It will be different in, in, in Mac OS X or Windows and so on. But end of the day, the identity lives in that certificate, and that certificate tells us uh, when, a, when they approach an enforcement point, uh, it tells us what their identity is, we verify from enterprise directory what their role is, and based on that, grant access to a, a crypto segment which is secured with the key. So I grant him access to send packets encrypted with the red key and, and, and receive packets with the red key. So after that identity is used, it's still limited to the red crypto segment, and he's not granted access to the uh, blue uh, segment if he, he does not have that authorization for it. Great question, great question, and, and definitely uh, cutting right to uh, one of the most important, important points about this innovation, which is that um, in order to have crypto segmentation that is truly end-to-end -end that is going to block the hacking attacks, you do need to uh, be able to do role-based access control, and that, of course, uh, involves understanding user identity and the roles that they, they play in the enterprise. Interesting question. Um, Jason, I have one here for you, uh, and this, uh, of course, uh, is interesting. It speaks directly to uh, your expertise around agile operations and digital transformation, which, of course, you've helped so many companies accomplish. So uh, does compartmentalization have an impact on operation agility and digital transformation, um, and uh, kind of a rephrasing here, does it limit the ability, using compartmentalization, does it limit the ability of an enterprise to be more agile operationally? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, that, that, yeah that's a great question. And to, to really answer the quest, this question, the specific question about compartmentalization, you have to first answer the question uh, for cybersecurity, broadly speaking, right? Does cybersecurity have an impact on business agility? Uh, and it's important to understand that if you get the cybersecurity right, it improves your agility. Uh, so the challenge is getting it right. And what part of the, uh, part of this uh, challenge, you know, getting this challenge right is placing cybersecurity into the appropriate context for any of the work that the organization does, whether it's software development or business operations. So essentially, the security should be an enabler, right? It should basically establish the ground rules for the operation of the business, and this includes uh, any sort of software development you may be doing. So what you don't want to do is make cybersecurity a bolt-on after the fact, because if you approach it that way, then you'll do what you're thinking of doing, and then you have to worry about security, and then you have to worry about all the problems with how you did your security, and, and it becomes this, uh, you know, uh, 
this money pit and rat hole of complexity. So uh, that's what you want to avoid. You want to make it essentially a proactive approach where you're establishing the ground rules, establishing how you're dealing with security so that now you're able to deal with the business challenges as, as, they, uh, as you face them. So in the context of compartmentalization, uh, if you take essentially uh, an older generation approach where all you're doing is segmenting your network, then you're going to have challenges with agility because it's up it, it doesn't. Uh, it, you're not set up to deal with the, the uh, dynamic needs of your business. You'll have to go back and you'll have to change everything around every time you have some sort of new application that requires some sort of new configuration. So this is one of the most important uh, differentiations that Certus brings to the table: is they do application level. Uh, compartmentalization, that crypto segmentation is at the application level. So it can be configured ahead of the fact to support the application context uh, that the business requires. So uh, this is the way you want to do it, right? You want to be able to set up your segmentation ahead of the fact and make it application-centric, because now if the, your application needs change, you can be proactive and set up the appropriate um, crypto segmentation in order to support changing needs of the organization. So this is all part of essentially shifting cybersecurity to the left, that is making it part of your initial uh, planning and testing phases that drive uh, more uh, dynamic and, and more rapid software development and in a, in a broader context, business operations overall. Those are some terrific insights, Jason. I, I know that those of us who have been in uh, security for quite some time are, are – uh, uh, often uh, accused of being the impediment or the hindrance at rolling out new applications and getting in the way of enterprise agility in that respect. And uh, uh, I think that you absolutely hit it on the head that uh, security needs to have a seat at the table very early on in planning these things. Uh, but then ultimately the enterprise needs to start looking at security as an enabler as opposed to an impediment or a hindrance. So very well put. I think we have time to squeeze in uh, one last question. Uh, Satyam, this one is for you. And it's also a question about our crypto flow solutions for crypto segmentation. Uh, the question is, how does this solution work with other tools a customer may have to monitor their network, like application performance monitoring tools or malware tools like FireEye? Yeah, again, a, a really good question and really hits the point. Uh, on a lot of the key innovations that Certi Solution has, and in fact, probably 10 of our patents are around this. So whenever we think of encryption, that's exactly what hits the mind. Once I encrypt, how do I monitor uh, and uh, for performance as well as to inspect for malware and other reasons? And, and when you are thinking of encryption, it is usually in context of point-to-point -point encryption like IPsec tunnels, SSL tunnels, or HTTPS, however, that is always point to point between one user and and another endpoint, and so on. Uh, the greatest thing Certis has done in the last 15 years, and a lot of IP around it, is that we built this technology called group encryption. Uh, and what that does is that this red lines that you are seeing in this figure, they are the exact same keys throughout. It's called group encryption because uh, all the keys are same. So for us to send our traffic to any uh, inspection point which needs to see it and clear is uh, all about dropping one more enforcer in front of a uh, 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 Gigamon type solution, for example, or an Xcout type solution, and then that would fork it off to different performance monitoring and malware monitoring tools like FireEye, or if you have some sort of net flow or something like that, uh, you will get all that. So it, un unlike point-to-point uh, -point encryption, group encryption really helps in accomplishing that. Another point I would like to make is that we are uni using cryptography uniquely in the sense that we are not uh, thinking of it only as a privacy and confidentiality tool. We are thinking of it more as a segregation and segmentation tool. So in certain cases, in certain data center environments, we may be employed just as an integrity tag with SHA-256 tag and, and have the traffic in clear. That's usually rare, but it's, it sometimes happens within the data center when we are doing micro segmentation inside. Very good. 
Thank you, Satyam. And uh, thanks again for the great questions. And thanks, everyone, for attending our webinar today. We hope you found it to be useful and interesting. Uh, I hope that uh, you'll take some time to download the new white paper that we told you about and also visit our website at certusnetworks.com where you can learn more about the crypto flow solutions for breach containment and crypto segmentation that we've been describing to you. Uh, thanks very much to Jason for bringing his insight and expertise to talking about these issues and helping us understand how the attack surface of enterprises is evolving. And thanks to Satya for uh, showing us some of the, the breakthrough technology that we're bringing to bear to help enterprises address this. Thank you all, and enjoy the rest of your day. And this is Sharon, the WebEx producer. I'd like to thank all of you, and you may now disconnect.